Uh, this evening, I have the opportunity of introducing uh, a friend, a professional colleague, and, and a wonderful historian. Uh, I met, when did, I, when did we meet? Through Phil Mason? At, at the first planning con uh, Yeah, we both got hooked into uh, planning the local history conference down at Wayne State University. And um, Liz is, is a wonderful genealogist. She's a certified genealogist and genealogist lecturer. This amazes me. She has created software programs, clues, if any of you are uh, genealogy buffs, an electronic filing cabinet for genealogical records in Gene Weaver, I like that name, uh, for family health history. She is the managing editor for a couple of magazines, Digital Genealogists and MGS News Magazine. She is an author. Uh, she uh, authored Plymouth's First Century Innovations in Industry, which is a, <coughs> a photo history of that community, which is important to me because my husband was born and raised in Plymouth. Um, Plymouth and Vintage Postcards, a great, great little book. And she is the director of the Plymouth Historical Museum. She also has done a lot of wonderful research on women during the Civil War. And we forget about the people who didn't go to war. We focus, as we have in our, um, in our camp today, on the soldiers who went off to war and their life. And forgot that there was a whole other world of people who stayed at home, kept towns, businesses, and farms running. Let's hear that story tonight. Would you help me welcome Ms. Kirsten? Thanks, Lorraine. Um, as Lorraine said, I'm the uh, director of the Plymouth Historical Museum, and so I'm going to give my two-second commercial before I start on my talk. Um, we have a fabulous special exhibit going on right now on Lincoln. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Plymouth Historical Museum, but um, we're in just about a block north of downtown Plymouth, and we're a pretty large museum for a small city. Uh, and we have a Lincoln collection that um, we purchased uh, about 12, 11, 12 years ago. Um, and so we have that always on exhibit, that's permanent, but because it's Lincoln's 200th anniversary this year, we also have a special exhibit that um, takes up our first, our ground floor, which is um, like if you've been to the Detroit Museum in the streets of Detroit, well, ours is Main Street, Plymouth, kind of, like uh, it might have appeared in 1900. And so it's got shops along it and stuff. It's pretty neat. So please come see it. Um, with the Lincoln exhibit, will be up until November 4th. And our admission is only five bucks. Great for a staycation opportunity this weekend or whenever. So there's my commercial. OK, um, I'm going to talk about uh, Plymouth women. And um, I did this because I just finished my master's in state and local history at Eastern Michigan. And um, this was my final uh, project that was required. I had to give a talk on some research that I had done. And um, this, I've been doing this, actually I was studying the men for the last six years or so because we had a company of, of men um, form in Kellogg Park, which is in downtown Plymouth, um, in um, August 1862. And they formed very quickly, and I'm going to talk about that. Um, but anyway, they were part of the Detroit, or the uh, Wayne County Regiment, the 24th Michigan. And so I've been studying them for a long time. And at the museum, we've had a little fundraiser, adopt a Civil War soldier. And so I've got all of the records that I could, military records, on these guys. And then during the course of my master's, um, I actually had to take a course on women's history. And, um, and I thought, eh, boring. Um, which is kind of ironic because I'm a retired Marine. And um, you know, if it wasn't for some of women's history, I would never have been able to serve the way that I did for 20 years. Uh, but, just typical of generations now that have what people had to work so hard for before, we just took it for granted. You know, that's, that's how it's always been. So I didn't really care about women's history. And then I started taking this class, and I was like, oh, there was women too. <laughs> okay, so then I got very interested, and now that's pretty much all I'm interested in, 
And so the soldiers are great. I'm glad I've done all that research, but now I want to concentrate on the women. So um, in case you don't know about Plymouth, because I know I'm, I'm north of there, um, the, uh, this is Plymouth Township. In, um, I don't, don't have a pointer, but um, anyway, Plymouth Township, uh, regular township back in um, the 1860 time period, regular township size. Not today. Today, Plymouth Township is a half a township because Northville separated from Plymouth in 1898, so we're a half township. Um, Northville is up at the top in the box at the top. Plymouth is down here. And then Borodino, and you'll hear about Borodino as I go, actually doesn't exist today as a little stop on the road, um, but it did in 1860 or 18, during the Civil War. And I'm sure that most of you know where Plymouth is anyway. Um, it's right in the northwest corner of Wayne County. We're as far west and as far north in Wayne County as you, well, no, now that Northville is separated <laughs> 100 and some years ago, um, we are not as far north as you can go, but you're, we're as far west as you can go. So anyway, and of course Detroit is um, east of us, and, um, and, and that's important with, um, with some of the relationships that, uh, that I've d t you know, learned about or um, found in the records, because um, is even though Plymouth was so far away from Detroit, it wasn't that far away from Detroit as far as um, the people in Detroit were concerned who were looking for volunteers to make, women, make bandages or whatever. So um, it, it may have seemed like a long way in 1860, but it wasn't really. And Plymouth was talked about quite a bit in the Detroit newspapers. So um, that's where I found some of the information that I'm going to share with you. OK, so um, I've been, I talked a little bit about uh, the guys from Company C. Um, the 24th Michigan was the Wayne County Regiment. Um, back when um, Abraham Lincoln made his call in July 1862 for 75,000 more men, uh, and Michigan answered the call, they um, brought to, uh, the, the governor said, we're going to have so many more regiments, and it would have taken it up to the 23rd Regiment. And Wayne County's like, wait, wait, we want to have our own regiment. And so they had to do some political maneuvering and stuff, but they convinced the governor and they had the 24th Regiment, um, which was from Wayne County. So, um, in, and this little clipping is from uh, one of the newspapers. I don't remember which one. Actually, I might have that. No. Um, but they said, war meeting at Plymouth. Um, Plymouth is wide awake. At the war meeting on Tuesday, 49 were enlisted and $3,000 was subscribed on the spot as bounties. Hooray for Plymouth. It is loyal. Plymouth has a kind of a unique history. And I'm actually reading a book now. Even though I'm done with my master's, I still love this stuff. And I read about it all the time. And um, I'm reading a book now on the, um, the birth of mass political parties. I know all of you th think that's thrilling, right? Um, but it, in Michigan. But it's very interesting. And um, so it's from like 18. Uh, 20 something to 1850. And um, the reason that it's such a good book in my mind is because Plymouth is mentioned all the time. And Plymouth was kind of an anomaly from m much of Wayne County, just as it is today. Wayne County is very Democratic, Plymouth is very Republican. And so um, it, it stood out then, stands out now. Um, mo most of Plymouth today still votes Republican. Um, so this is perhaps part of the reason why the um, Company C was formed so quickly. Uh, it was um, on August 5th that they had the meeting in the park in, in Plymouth. And this, the company was full by August 14th. And by Civil War standards, that is very rapid. Um, and so I, as I was working on these guys, I compiled some of these statistics, uh, which is also, besides the Republican part, part of the reason why it filled so quickly, because of there's 100 men in a company, 20 of them were brothers. Not all the same family, but you know there was a number of them that were brothers. 12 were cousins, along with an uncle and three nephews. There was five sets of brothers-in-law, one set of four men, and another set of three men who were all brothers-in-law of each other. 
and then one guy was engaged to another guy's sister. So, and that's the ones I've discovered so far. I'm sure that there's more lurking because I just discovered a relationship while I was putting this together. So um, the whole company seems to have been interconnected except for a couple people um, that were kind of thrown into the mix at the very end. Like one very young guy was uh, from Detroit and was put into the company down at Fort Wayne. Uh, and he's not got any relations to anybody. But it seems like they, they all knew each other or were related to each other. OK, 32% of the soldiers were married at enlistment, which is a little bit high number for an average company. 65% um, of them lived in Plymouth Township in August 1862. And of course, most of them had sisters, wives, mothers living in the Plymouth area. So with all of that in mind, um, what were the women doing when these guys left? Because you know somebody had to run the farms or um, somebody had to run the store or whatever was going on. Um, so were they able to contribute to the war effort? And that was kind of like my thesis statement or my thesis question for this um, research. But, but as a result, some underlying questions started popping up like, um, did Plymouth women have a history of social activism? Um, if, if they were, in fact, socially engaged during the Civil War, did it just start then? Or did they have a history of doing this kind of stuff? And um, of course, what personal struggles did um, families of soldiers go through? Because you know, somebody may, lots of people may have been able to do um, social work during the time, but you know there's going to be families that struggled. Uh, and so how, what kind of records exist for them? OK. So um, the Michigan Anti-Slavery Society was formed in um, Adrian in 1852 and seems to have survived until about 1857. And um, this is different that if you've heard of this organization, there was also a Michigan State Anti-Slavery Society that formed in uh, 1836 in Ann Arbor and was floundering by about 1848. So um, there was a period of about four years when there was no organized anti-slavery society in um, southeast Michigan. Uh, but then this Michigan Anti-Slavery Society was formed in Adrian. And its purpose was to abolish slavery and to help slaves escape from the south. So this is the first real record that I found that had Plymouth women on it. It's, it's hard to find women in records in this time period. Not impossible, very difficult though. And um, so I found the, these records are actually, the originals are at the William Clements Library at the University of Michigan. And there is transcripts of them at the um, uh, Michigan State Library. I don't know how long you'll have access to those transcripts if the library gets closed, but anyway. Um, so William Clements Library has these originals and um, Hattie Fuller, was from Plymouth, and her and her husband were actually very active in the anti-slavery society. And um, Lucina Fuller was her daughter. And then Mrs. it says Mrs. Pennyman, um, there was a, um, Ebenezer Pennyman was the, like one of the biggest um, moneyed people in Plymouth at the time, and that's his wife. And, um, and he was also later one of the big contributors for the Civil War effort. So, so this is the first evidence I'm finding of Plymouth women showing up in um, doing uh, benevolent types of activities. This is downtown Plymouth. How many of you have been to Plymouth before? Few, most of you. It still looks like this today pretty much, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Except for maybe the horses and uh, the dirt street. but. Um, it hasn't changed a whole lot. It, it still looks similar, and um, it's still got a unique character, I think. Um, the Detroit Daily Advertiser of November 10, 1856, uh, ran a, a uh, letter to the editor from Plymouth that said, Dear Sir, as the smoke, this is a presidential campaign year. Dear Sir, as the smoke of the presidential contest clears away, we naturally recur to the incidents of the campaign. Among the notice, noticeable things is the mass meeting at this place on Saturday, November 1st, a magnificent demonstration never before equaled in the county of Wayne and out of Detroit. 
Over 300 wagons <clears throat> closely filled with people were in the procession, and a large number besides were at the same time stationary in the village. Over 300 men on horseback headed the procession and presented a splendid sight. One of the wagons had over 50 ladies, others 39 persons, and all well filled with men and ladies. One team of 16 yoke of superior oxen drew a full load of ladies. The Plymouth Brass Band, which is what you're seeing here, of which all our people are proud, were also out. No actual count could be had, but over 4,000, perhaps 5,000 people were gathered together. That's about how many we draw for um, art in the park these days. That's, that's a lot of people in downtown Plymouth. Long tables were spread with refreshments for over 700 ladies from abroad who were bountifully supplied and waited upon by the patriotic Republican ladies of our town. Our ladies are true samples of the Jesse spirit for what they undertake, they will do, and it's no use of talking. <laughs> Signed, an old line wig. This is 1856, and the wigs, you know, are kind of on the outs <laughs> in 1856. Republican Party was started in 1854, so. Um, but anyway, uh, again, early evidence of Plymouth women um, this is patriotic stuff, but they're still there putting food out and um, you know, helping out uh, the cause. Okay, so shortly after Fort Sumter fell and the buildup of Northern troops began, um, the US Army really quickly found out that it was not up to the task of providing uh, a lot of supplies for the soldiers. And so in the spring of 1861, the Women's Central Association of Relief for the Sick and Wounded of the Army, which was an organiza organization of upper class women in New York, uh, New York City, uh, what, that was established. And um, they asked a group of prominent men for advice on how to proceed. And they had to do that because women were not able to run their own organizations, at least according to, um, actually I, I was going to say at least according to men, but according to many women as well. Women, they just didn't do that kind of stuff then. So um, in May 1861, this group of men sent a delegation to Washington to offer their services to the War Department and to lobby for a voice um, in the conduct of the conflict. And um, President Lincoln, from that meeting, President Lincoln authorized the creation of the United States Sanitary Commission, which you may have heard of. And it was a private organization. It was not ever part of the military. Eventually, that Women's Central Relief Association that was formed before that, uh, before the Sanitary Commission, eventually it came under the umbrella of the Sanitary Commission, which kind of um, didn't sit well with the women that had started the Women's Central Relief Association, but that's how it turned out. So, okay, so what's a woman to do? Um, Women were, in 1861, lived in separate spheres from men. They did not, um, usually if they were having dinner, um, they would eat, everybody would, like if they had visitors, they would eat together, and then the men would retire to one room and have cigars and talk, men things, and the women would go clean up and do whatever. But they didn't you, um, do things together at that point. Um, they were not expected to be able to organize anything but their households. They, weren't, they didn't think, men didn't think, and many women didn't think that women had the capacity, mental capacity, to handle that kind of stuff. Uh, so while Michigan women had been participating in, <clears throat> in benevolent activities for years, um, in the capacity, under the capacity of their churches, um, like passing out Bibles, encouraging abstinence from alcohol, or assisting with the abolitionist movement, um, it, it was just within the scope of their churches that they did these things. Although, um, unfortunately, they don't show up in church records, at least not for Plymouth, this early. Um, I haven't been able to find them in any church records this early. At the beginning of the Civil War, there were active Presbyterian, Methodist, Baptist, and Congregational churches in Plymouth Township and they also spilled over into Salem Township in Washtenaw County, which is right, is the next county, our next township over to the west of Plymouth. Um, and like I said, I, I was unable to find them. Now, what I, when I was reading this over last night, what I found interesting was, there's a Troy example in here. This is um, the impact of the Civil War on the Presbyterian Church in Michigan. And um, this talks about Mrs. Duffield, who was um, the Detroit version of 
the founder of the Women's Central Relief Association in New York, she kind of got the women going in Detroit very early in uh, May 1861. And then um, this says, the people of Troy, Oakland County, have presented each of the 11 Troy volunteers in the Pontiac County Light Guard with a number one Colt's revolver, according to the Detroit Daily Tribune in May 1861. So that was actually very common, that um, as groups were um, getting ready to go off to war, that the women would either make them a flag or um, present them with various things as they were leaving. That was really, really common in the Civil War. Um, so, th but this talks about the different um, Presbyterian and Methodist Episcopal churches and the types of things that women were doing. Women of the Meth Methodist Episcopal Church were used to working together. As I said earlier, that under the auspices of their church, they were used to working and sewing and um, cooking. So that was not abnormal. But then the, um, it says that the Michigan um, Methodist churches formed soldiers aid societies. Um, I think that they're giving more credit to the Methodist churches than perhaps um, should be because it wasn't just Methodists. Presbyterians were very heavily involved in soldiers aid societies um, and so, to some extent some of the other churches. But um, Methodists and Presbyterians were very actively involved in the soldiers aid societies. So in Detroit, Soldiers Aid Society was formed in, on November 6, 1861, and it became the main channel for funneling donations from Michigan citizens to distribu distribution points in uh, Washington, D.C., New York, Chicago, and St. Louis. Uh, and then in August 1863, that society was designated the United States Sanitary Commission Michigan Soldiers Aid Society. Um, the society was organized and operated by women, which was unusual compared to other um, societies, uh, such societies in, in bigger cities. The, the other ones may have been organized initially by women, but were taken over by men, just like the Women's Central Relief Association was. Um, but in Detroit, it was women that, um, that kept charge of the uh, Soldiers' Aid Society. Valeria Campbell was the society's corresponding secretary throughout its existence and she was the glue that kept the organization together. She, has, she maintained volumes of correspondence and uh, for whatever reason, the, the stuff has survived but it's split up between the Burton Historical Collection in Detroit, at the Detroit Public Library and um, the um, Bentley Historical Library at the University of Michigan. Um, the only thing I can think is that um, some of the stuff was with her brother who was a, um, lawyer, I think, um, and he was a graduate of University of Michigan, and so his papers were donated to the University of Michigan, and so some of her stuff went there too, but there is just as much stuff at the Burton, so um, I don't know the answer why. But um, what, I'm, what I've been able to do is show you some, some of the records. This is, um, of course, a, a newspaper <coughs> clipping from the Bentley and talks about the forming of the Soldiers Aid Society. And um, up here it talks about the fact that they formed, but down here, this is from uh, late 1861, early 1862, they list the types of things that um, they want people to donate or um, to make. And so that's what they were doing is, they were making bandages, they were making shirts, um, all of the types of things that soldiers might need that are not being provided by the army. And so that's what they were asking for in this article. And then they started keeping track of the items. Now, this, if you remember, I mentioned Borodino earlier, and it was that little teeny um, spot down in southwest Plymouth Township. Uh, Borodino answered the call very early, and um, even though there was probably only a handful of families that lived there, um, they somehow formed a soldier's aid society and um, started sending stuff. And this is an November 1862 record showing Borodino sending one um, either barrel or box of something. So, um, and then I found some records that talked about the um, Sanitary Commission auxiliaries. And um, they, this is from the Bentley as well. It lists Borodino, Plymouth, and Northville as well as several other places. But 
what I was trying to find was I, I really wanted to find my soldiers' wives or mothers or sisters in the records so that you know, I could take this story from start to finish with the soldiers and the, their women. And um, I was able to somewhat. Um, I was hoping I'd find letters that said, we went and did this in Plymouth or something. And I'll show you, I did find one. Um, but what's fun about this record is this is Borodino, and it lists the two people who were the uh, correspondents from Borodino. And this uh, Miss M.J. Fairman was the sister of one of the soldiers from Plymouth. Um, his name was Zebra Fairman. Um, and then Plymouth, Miss Elizabeth McClumpha was kind of, kind of related <laughs> to one of the soldiers, but kind of up and over and down, not really um, directly related. But Miss Mary Davis um, ended up being instrumental, and I'll talk a little bit about her later. And then Northville um, had Sarah Cochran, who the DAR chapter in Plymouth and Northville is named for. She ended up being a librarian at the Burton. I'm mean, at yeah, at the Burton. Um, so she's not related to any of the soldiers, but she had a, a, a very good history in that area. Okay, so Mary Jane Fairman, this is um, her in later life. She was, um, I think, in her late teens, early 20s at the time of the Civil War. And um, a, much of the war she spent um, li in training. She went to uh, a, um, a female seminary and became a teacher. And so she wasn't even living in the Detroit area for much of it. And the Fairmans let, had, they wrote to each other all the time. There was 11 children in the family and they actually owned much of the land in Borodino. And um, so I, I've gone through the Fairman letters but many of them are difficult to read because they're microfilmed and the microfilming was terrible. And, um, but I was able to find this letter that um, was from Valeria Campbell to Miss M.J. Fairman of Borodino from 1863. And she's talking about we received, or the, the barrel that was received from Borodino, uh, that was sent from Borodino was received at its ultimate destination, which was one of the locations where soldiers were. Um, and so here, and here's the Borodino area again that you saw earlier just blown up. But here's, this F.W. Fairman is Mary Jane's brother. Um, and he inherited, the, this is actually from an 1876 atlas. So his father owned the land um, before that. Uh, and, and I found a newspaper clipping about Mary Jane Fairman um, actually getting a job in Ann Arbor as a teacher after she graduated from the female seminary. So I, I was hoping to find letters that Mary Jane wrote to um, her brother talking about the stuff she was doing with the Soldiers' Aid Society, but um, I can't read so many of the letters that it's very frustrating. Uh, and then this is, as I said, the Soldiers' Aid Society was renamed the Michigan Soldiers' Aid Society in um, 1863. This is um, a, a list of 1863 receipts at the, the Michigan Soldiers' Aid Society, and again, Borodino is listed. Uh, twice down here. Plymouth doesn't start showing up until later. So I'm, I'm just having a hard time thinking, you know, there was a few people living in Borodino and lots of people living in Plymouth. And these women in Borodino were sending stuff off on a regular basis and I'm not quite sure what the women of Plymouth were doing at the time. Sarah Ann Cochran, I mentioned earlier, she was living in Northville. And um, she wrote a couple letters to uh, the Soldiers' Aid Society in Detroit. And in the first one, this is from 1861, she wanted to be there right away. They already had a, um, a group of women in, in uh, Northville in November 1861 that were getting together and sewing and, and doing things like that. And she's offering their services uh, for sewing. And um, this is a picture of her that's from our archives. And then I did find a bio, uh, her obituary said that she was active during the Civil War and worked for the US Sanitary Commission. Like I said, it's, it's very difficult to find information on women in this period. And so I had to try everything I could think of. And this is where my genealogical training 
came in because I'm used to looking for little teeny clues in records and so I'm looking at all kinds of records just for one little hint of a woman um, and, and some of these women never married so that's actually a good thing <laughs> but um, not if you want to find your ancestors but um, in this case it was good because Sarah and Cochran never married, Mary Jane Fairman married but later after the Civil War and um, Elizabeth McClumpha from Plymouth who I mentioned earlier she never married so those people of course are easier to find in records it's when they marry that they disappear if you don't know um, who they married so um, there was a couple more letters that I found that were by Sarah Cochran and um, this one in this one she's talking about the uh, shirts that the women made and this is just a, a painting of uh, what I imagine it would have looked like with these women sitting around doing um, their sewing this is a quilt but um, she talks about uh, first she talks about we'll, we'll make these shirts and then she says well we made some shirts but um, we had some difficulty with the collars and so we kind of changed the pattern hope you don't mind <laughs> so um, and this is a blow up of Northville area from that atlas that I showed you earlier okay so then as I progress the records get better um, the further into the Civil War that you go because it, earlier there they weren't the Sanitary Commission and others weren't as organized as they were later and so I started finding um, things that correlated which was very interesting like this <coughs> this is the first time I found Plymouth showing up in the records in 1863 and um, it says Plymouth and it lists a whole bunch of stuff and then this is an uh, annual report of the sanitary or the soldiers aid society and it says Plymouth one barrel BBL is the abbreviation for barrel I have no idea why um, <coughs> it says one barrel of hospital stores and so I started finding records and then articles that talked about the records or the, the stuff um, and that was um, I thought was interesting to find again here um, Plymouth is listed as sending um, shirt and uh, fruit and that stuff and and then here it says December 5th then it says December 5th up here <coughs> one cask of pickled cabbage from Borodino and one barrel of soap in stores from Plymouth so you know I've found the records um, and the article but still no names <laughs> okay so then I found the letter the one letter finally um, and this is a Fairman Lib Fairman Root um, is Mary Jane Fairman's sister and she married uh, I don't know exactly when she married but she was married and living in Redford uh, for most of the Civil War and she wrote also they all wrote very prolifically and she wrote to her brother Sieb and that's her, him he was in Charlie Company C Company 24th Michigan and so she wrote him on May 8, 1864 it said that um, Phoebe and her were going to Plymouth last Wednesday to take Sieb which is her son um, to get his photo but could not instead um, they went they took a barrel of apple pickles and 12 shirts and lots of bandages and then down here is the receipt from that same time Plymouth and it says 12 shirts here and uh, bandages and apples so that was that was gold you know I mean finding something finally that had a name I was looking for linked to records but that's about the only one like that so unfortunately so far I'm not done with this research but so far some more receipts now I guess about 1864 Borodino and Plymouth women said maybe we ought to join forces because all the rest of the records that I found say Borodino and Plymouth and they say SAS which is Soldiers Aid Society so they must have come together at some point um, and decided to um, help each other uh, and then um, later on 1864 I found this Methodist Baptist or Presbyterian Church in Plymouth um, and these are just postcard pictures of the churches uh, as they would have looked in um, Civil War um, 
I was hoping to find church records that said women were doing this and this. And uh, Presbyterian records exist still from um, Salem Township and also um, the, uh, uh, what's it called, uh, Congregational Church records exist from Salem Township. Plymouth records are uh, not that easy to find and um, I don't think that the Baptists kept records like that and the Methodist records I haven't located yet, they may exist somewhere. Um, but the Presbyterians didn't mention women in their records until like 1869 was the first mention. So they totally missed the Civil War. But what I found important, what, what I found interesting was that all of those women that you saw in the um, record that said the auxiliaries, all six of those women were Presbyterian. So I was, like, like I said, I was hoping to find their names in the records doing this, but I didn't. Okay, um, in 1864, Michigan, the uh, Soldiers Aid Society of Kalamazoo held a sanitary fair. Sanitary fairs were very popular in late 1863 up and through 1865. And what that meant, it was kind of like a state fair, um, but the proceeds went to the sanitary organizations to help either pay for other supplies that, um, that the women weren't making, you know, that they could send on to soldiers. Um, sometimes they split the proceeds. Uh, the Detroit Soldiers Aid Society had participated in a soldiers or a sanitary fair with Chicago um, in late 1863 and um, really got the short end of the deal. They sent over all these people, women, to help out with this huge fair and the Chicago people never shared any money. And so Valeria Campbell, who was the secretary, um, had a bad taste in her mouth and so when it came time to coordinate with um, the Kalamazoo people, she had contracts and had specifically stated everything that they were going to get out of it if they provided the people. Um, so, but I did find some records th that were specifically about the sanitary fair and uh, Plymouth is mentioned in them. Presbyterian Church sent some money, $18.42. Not a whole lot, but you know, if that's all they could get. Okay. Uh, let me see. Um, the the uh, sanitary fair was a complete success and netted about ninety thousand dollars. So um, and it was held in conjunction with the state agricultural fair. Okay, the Christian Commission. This this has been um, a passion of mine. The Christian Commission records are held at the National Archives in Washington. And it's kind of an anomaly for the National Archives because the National Archives is charged with um, housing government records. And the Christian Commission is similar to the Sanitary Commission. It was formed in 1861 as a private organization and it was supposed to deal with the um, uh, religious uh, needs of the soldiers. But somehow the War Department ended up with, with the records that survived and they're really fascinating and they're not in any order. And so last year uh, when I started working on this research on the women, I was in Washington and um, I, I went through the first maybe th six or seven boxes and found two letters from Plymouth which just blew my mind. I have been through a whole lot more since then and I haven't found any more from Plymouth. So somehow I lucked out on those first two. But this is one of them. And um, as I mentioned, you know, there were people that weren't just making bandages uh, and, um, you know, sit sitting around trying to figure out how they could help the soldiers. There were people that were actually suffering. And um, in this case, Lucius Shattuck was one of the um, lieutenants in Company C, 24th Michigan, and he was killed in Gettysburg. Um, and we have at the museum, we have some of his letters, but also the rest of the letters are at the Bentley Historical Library. And this letter mentions Ed Edmund Corey, or Edward Corey, who was another soldier from Company C, and he was um, injured at Gettysburg, and then died uh, a few days, or like the, 16th of July or something, you know, shortly after Gettysburg. And he left a wife and um, 
as this letter says here, uh, she is left without anything, only her pension and what she has saved of his bounty and wages. And she has two girls, one is 16 and the other 12. So, uh, you know, in the, um, in the Civil War, when, uh, when everybody has all this fear of going to fight to save the Union, they don't think about, um, you know, what, how much money am I going to leave back here to take care of my wife and kids. Um, this guy didn't leave anything and he got killed. And so I found this letter in the Christian Commission records and it's from um, the Christian Commission office in Detroit to the Christian Commission in Philadelphia, which was their headquarters, <coughs> asking for help getting his body back to Michigan because she had no money at all. And so the, um, many soldiers, of course, um, were buried where they lay, but she wanted to bring his body back. I'm not sure if she was successful or not, but I do know that his tombstone is in Riverside Cemetery in Plymouth. I don't know if there's a body underneath it or not. <coughs> it, by 1864, Michigan had figured out that it needed to provi provide relief to soldiers' families. And, um, but, so the Michigan legislature passed a law saying that they would, the counties would provide relief to soldiers' families, but the counties had to pay for it because the state had no money. Sounds familiar? Um, so uh, I have been able to find these records called um, Journal of Volunteer Relief Fund for Oakland County, and there's also one that I found for Washtenaw County, which I'll show you. Um, this article talks about relief to soldiers' families and about all the ins and outs, and that it was the county's responsibility. Ezra Derby was uh, a private with Company C, and um, his wife, uh, Maria, lived in Farmington. And so because of that, the, what, they, what the counties did was they went through, first of all, and itemized all the soldiers that um, were from their area <coughs> that had family. And so those are the first part of the records. And then the second part of the records are the family members and um, how much money they rated. And it was only like $8 a month um, that they got, but at least they got something. And so, um, or $4 in this case, $4. Uh, so that's what this is. This is Ezra, and it says that his wife was Maria. I'm not sure who David York is, because um, they didn't have any kids. So I don't know who that guy is. Um, but then this is the second part that shows Ezra Derby. He's the soldier and the amount of money that his wife was being given and how often. So that information is really cool to find. And um, the rec these records are, well, you could probably see the originals um, in Oakland County, uh, but I looked at them um, on microfilm from the Family History Library in Salt Lake City. And then this is the Washtenaw County one. Uh, because um, Plymouth is so close to Oakland County on the north and Washtenaw County on the west. We had soldiers from, from all three counties. And so um, there was a number of soldiers that were from Washtenaw County, mostly from Salem Township. And that was where this was from. Um, Anna Kells was married to William Kells. And um, as the, the guy I talked about previously, Ezra, was um, killed in uh, the Civil War. And so his wife ended up um, really needing the money even more. Now, Anna Kells, I'm not sure what their story is. I haven't figured it out yet because William came back and they went on to live a long life. So I guess they were just poor. I don't know. Um, but their information shows up. So this is another place that information about women can show up during the Civil War. And then there was an organization called the Michigan Soldiers Relief Association. There was a lot of similar named organizations uh, in Michigan. Michigan was very patriotic. Um, the Michigan Soldiers Relief Association was probably the first state agency organized for work among state regiments in the field in 1861. <clears throat> At least they claimed to be. Um, its activities were directed primarily by a small group of Michiganders who were living in the District of Columbia uh, in the early months of the Civil War. And they coordinated their effort, efforts between um, the Michigan Soldiers Relief Society and the Sanitary Commission. 
Uh, in the first half of 1864, the association received $4,300 in contributions, mostly from small towns. This is a press copy of their, their records are also at the Burton Historical Collection, at least some of them are, and most of them are press copies like this, you know, a, kind of like our modern um, uh, photocopy. Um, and uh, this is a press copy of a letter from the Michigan Soldiers Relief Association to Calvin Crosby in Plymouth, thanking the citizens of Plymouth for sending a donation of $36. This is a picture of Calvin Crosby. He was um, a state senator uh, for two years and um, coincidentally was the first captain of Company C, uh, 24th Michigan, but he only lasted. They, they left in August 1862 and he was home by December because his constitution wasn't fit for war, so he came home. Uh, but he was a businessman in Plymouth, and so he was, he was the guy that got the, the whole company formed, and so since he couldn't do the war thing, he kept trying to help the soldiers after he got home. And this is another letter uh, from the Michigan Soldiers Relief Association to him, and this time thanking the Plymouth citizens for their $130 donation. So, um, you know, maybe the women weren't making as many bandages as I was hoping, but they are collecting money and sending it off to various organizations. There was a lot of um, fighting between the, some of these organizations. The Sanitary Commission and the Christian Commission were um, constantly pitted against each other, and uh, the Sanitary Commission kind of um, was, was the good guy from 1861 to 1863 and kind of started going down after that and the Christian Commission didn't do a whole lot 1861 to 63 and then started on the rise after that because the Christian Commission um, representatives that went out into the field were chaplains or uh, ministers or whatever and were not paid and they went for six weeks and then came back. The Sanitary Commission people were paid and so people thought that their donations were going to pay these people, and there was all, all kinds of controversy about that. So there's, there's lots of different records and newspaper articles about the controversy between them. <clears throat> um, and this is a letter I found for at the very end of the existence of the Michigan Soldiers Aid Society, and it's from, uh, if you remember, Mary Jane Fairman that I mentioned earlier, this is her sister-in-law, Mrs. F. W. Fairman. Uh, she wrote in May 1867 to Valeria Campbell, who was probably by this time kind of tired of correspondence with the uh, Soldiers' Aid Society, but um, still had this in her records. And um, it says, Miss V. Campbell, I forward by this day's mail $50 contributed by the people of Plymouth in aid of the suffering South, hoping to learn if the money reaches the treasurer safely. I am Mrs. F.W. Fairman. So the women are still concerned. Now they're not concerned about soldiers, but they're concerned about the people that are suffering in the South. After the war, uh, during the war, many women um, were able to do occupations that men left behind, kind of like in World War I, World War II, where the, the men went off and women had to fill the void. Um, that happened in the Civil War too, but when the soldiers came home at the end of the Civil War, women just kind of melted into the background and it was okay with them. It, it, in subsequent wars, it became less okay each war. But um, there were some people that were organizers and had found their niche in organizing and it was not okay with them to just kind of melt into the background. And the, as a result, the Women's Christian Temperance Unit, Union was formed in um, Michigan in 1874. The Plymouth chapter was formed that same year. Mary Davis, who is one of the people I had mentioned earlier who was in the Plymouth Auxiliary, was one of the founders of the Plymouth uh, Soldiers' Aid Society. And the uh, Women's Christian Temperance Unit Union was, um, they took up the cause of uh, temperance and tried to get um, people to stop drinking. They would. Um, they met in churches to pray and then marched to, to saloons and asked the owners to close their establishments, which, you know, of course they said, oh, sure. <laughs> um, but I, I think that it might still exist today. I'm, I'm not sure in some form or fashion. Um, 
But anyway, that was an organization that was in Plymouth for a long time and it started right away as soon as it was founded. Voting, women voting, of course um, you know when the 19th Amendment was passed in 1920, but I'm not sure how many of you know that women in Michigan have a long history of voting before other women. And so this is just kind of a quick summary. Um, women taxpayers in 1867 were first allowed to vote in school elections. There was um, suffrage movements on and off throughout the 19th century in Michigan and they, they, they um, waxed and waned and um, lots of times before the Civil War they took back seat to um, the temperance or um, uh, abolition movements and um, so they didn't get very far. After the Civil War, women, some women still wanted to advocate for suffrage but then there was women that were more concerned about getting black men the right to vote and so women took a back seat again so it just keeps going up and down. Um, so anyway, the, the different voting um, dates are here. Um, 1893, the Michigan legislature passed a municipal suffrage bill and the, then the Michigan Supreme Court decided that the legislature had no right to create a new class of voters and declared the law unconstitutional. But in 1907 to 8, const a constitutional convention was held and um, it defeated women's suffrage but allowed women who paid taxes uh, to vote in elections concerning local tax and bond issues. And that's what this record on top is. Uh, Teresa Weed was the wife of one of my soldiers from C Company 24th Michigan. Minot Weed was a soldier and she's the only one listed on this page. We have the original records in the archives in Plymouth. And um, in 1910, she was voting. So um, she's one of the first women in Plymouth that voted. And then women were, in 1917 in Michigan, women were granted the right to vote in presidential elections, which was earlier than uh, most other states. So uh, Michigan were voting, Michigan women were voting before most of the women in the nation. And the tradition continued. And I found this article in the newspaper, in the Plymouth newspaper, from 1918 of uh, a unit of the Women's Committee of the Council of National Defense was organized in Plymouth uh, during World War I. I didn't go further than that, but um, I'm sure that in World War II they did stuff. So that's my research and um, there's still a whole lot more to do. I hope to actually do a book one of these days. I was going to do a book on the guys. Now I think I'm going to do a book on the women and put the guys in there, but in the back. <laughs> now they'll get to go in there. But anyway, does anybody have any questions? Liz, yeah. I just did a presentation to the Friends of the Trade Public Library, and I started out by talking about Clara Barton and how in 1861 she was organizing the American Red Cross. <coughs> was there ever any evidence that you found that? An organization with that name or a chapter of the Red Cross was established in Michigan? Um, I didn't see anything. However, um, we have some records in Plymouth of Red Cross women in World War I, I think. Um, but I, I don't remember seeing anything on Red Cross in Michigan. And I purposely did not look at women that did things that have been written about quite a bit, like women disguised as soldiers. And as far as I know, no women from Plymouth did that. Um, or women who went off to be nurses or um, maids or whatever. I, I didn't look for any of that stuff because there's been a lot written on that. There has not been a lot of written on women doing benevolent activities. And so I, I just felt like it was something that needed to be dealt with. And, so watch for my book in 50 years <laughs> when I have time to sit down and write it. Did you have a question? On one of the articles where it showed what they were sending uh, items, women were sending items, I was trying to read it, but you moved. And one of the items though said that they were sending silk green eye shades. I didn't know what it was. I was like, what in the heck were they would be sending? Do you know how far back it was? Well, during the Civil War. No, I mean, I mean in my talk. <laughs> in the middle. Uh, one of the Oops. long articles, it was over here on this side, 
that the stocks they were sending, uh, linen towels that I found, and uh, these. This one? Uh, was that it? Wait a minute. Let's see. Does that say? I think that was it. There. See? Green silk eye shades. Handkerchiefs, yeah, socks, okay, slippers, I can see it. But what in the heck in the Civil War were green silk eye shades? Possibly. I didn't think they had What about eyes? injuries? One of the big things that women <coughs> who were shot, you know, head injuries, who, who, why would they have to use the green silk? I mean, you know, a band aid should be better to put on some kind of cotton or gauze or something like that. Well, uh, don't forget that medicine was not. Um, very advanced at all. Um, I mean, they did lots of stupid things medically in the Civil War, um, but but not to them. Right. No, I understand that. To them, yeah, I, would, I would guess that since a lot of it was medical supplies or relief supplies, food, mm -hmm. medicine, blankets, things like that. It, one of the things that Martin said was that there were. What she noticed was they didn't have the supplies that they needed. There were people there to treat the nurses and that to treat injuries, but in many cases they were lacking basic material supplies. And so a lot of these relief agencies worked really hard to spend, send goods, whether it was uh, bandages or blankets or candles or what was considered medicine at that time. Well, and bandages. You, you know, we kind of probably mentally picture Band-Aids. No. no, they no. took cotton and tore sheets. Yep, uh, so that's what they did, was sit and tear sheets or, um, or whatever they had uh, to make bandages. Other questions? One of the things that I think is, is wonderful with, with what Liz has presented is how slow and methodical and challenging primary research is. You know, we think about, we pick up a book and, and say, oh, I read this wonderful book about the Civil War or about whatever topic, and we don't realize that you have to tease little tiny yeah. facts out from long, sometimes boring lists and records that seem to have no relationship with one another. And it's an hallelujah day when two pieces of information connect and it opens a window for you. So thank you for giving yeah. us a view into that. We really appreciate it. Well, and <laughs> thank you. I was just going to add that um, none of this was found on the internet, which is one of my bugaboos with genealogy. Um, I just last week was at a genealogy conference in Raleigh, North Carolina, and I um, presented a couple talks there. And um, one of them was on uh, collecting data on the internet. And I always remind people at the beginning of that talk that all the records aren't on the internet. And in fact, none of these records are on the internet. It takes going to the repository and, I mean, actually most of this isn't even on microfilm. It's still textual records, original stuff. And, um, it, but, but that's what I love to do, so it doesn't bother me. But it, it does bother people that like to gather surnames on the internet and add them into their ancestry. Have any of you visited the Burton? You yeah. mentioned, well, you mentioned the, the Burton, and I think you have the Bentley in there. Burton, Bentley, and Clements Library. The so Bentley and the Clements are both <coughs> in Ann Arbor. They are both incredible repositories. With different focuses. The Bentley is uh, Michigan and University of Michigan, and the Clements is Americana. And the Clements is really kind of like one of the best kept secrets in um, great uh, historical libraries in this area. Because not a lot of people go there, but they've got some fabulous records, not just Michigan. They have inc incredible maps. They have a map collection, I think, on parallel. They have a Civil War soldier uh, letters collection that's pretty awesome. I did my internship for, uh, under Dr. Mason in the archives program at the Clements. And uh, they just have a really phenomenal collection. They also have some of the original Jesuit relations, which when I saw those little tiny you know, it takes up this much space on the shelf. 
but that's some of the original information we have about this region going back to the 1600s. So it's, it's important stuff in those kinds of institutions truly need to have our support because they hold the history. Again, thank you. Thank you.